right, we've already talked about all the different kinds of instruments, at least the ones we're going to listen to for the most part in this class. So now let's look at how those instruments are put together. We call those combinations of instruments and voices ensembles. So we're going to look at some of the standard ensemble combinations right now so that when you go to a concert, you would know what to expect. So we're going to start really big and work our way down to smaller kinds of ensembles. So let's start with the biggest instrumental ensemble, and that is the orchestra, which is sometimes also called the symphony orchestra, a philharmonic orchestra. Now, those are just fancier names for the same thing. They're all going to be pretty much the same. So there's fairly standard instrumentation that would be in an orchestra. Now, the numbers change depending on the type of piece that we're playing. So suppose that the orchestra is playing something by Mozart. In Mozart's time, the symphony only had maybe 40 players in it. So much smaller orchestra, fewer winds, uh, sort of very heavily string uh, oriented. We get into the 19th century or in the 20th century and we might have an orchestra that has a hundred people in it. And we're going to have a lot more percussion and a lot more woodwinds and a lot more brass. And then if we add all those things, we also have to add a lot more string players because they can't play nearly as loudly. So you have to have a bunch of string players to balance out even like one tuba just to make everything balance out right. So that's why the numbers look kind of funny if you're thinking, well, they've got one of those, why do they need a lot of them? It's because of, of balance. We have to get enough sound from those other instruments to make it work. So sort of a standard orchestra or arrangement that you would see would be, um, and I'm gonna try to point this right so it looks like, so I'm the, I'm the orchestra, ta-da, orchestra. So you're the audience and as you're looking at the stage on this side in the front, will be the violins. The violins are actually broken into two parts, so you can think of them um, sort of like the soprano and mezzo-soprano violins because they're both high instruments. So there would be violins, another little section of violins. We call those the first violins and the second violins. And there are probably 10 to 12 of each of those. And then as we sort of work our way around the orchestra, toward the middle near the near the conductor will be more string players and those will be the viola players. Uh, six to eight of those usually depending on the, the period of music we're working on. Then as you work your way around to the other side of the stage, usually you will see the cellos right up there next to the conductor. And again, there might be six to 10 of those. They can make a lot of sound so we don't have to have quite as many. Usually back on the back of the row, you'll see the string bass players. We haven't even really talked about them very much because frankly, they don't get to play a lot. They're in the orchestra, they play in jazz bands. Other than that, they kind of get left out of ensemble work. So this is about the only time you'll see them. They'll be standing up usually in the back row. Some of them may you may see sitting on stools, similar to what I'm sitting on um, and have the instrument resting on them, but some of them also stand up. So strings all around the front, person in the middle, the conductor, he's the guy with the baton. He's the one that's going to keep everything together. So we've got our orchestra all here with all our string players. We might stop right there. That could be a string orchestra. And we see that happen because a string orchestra plays um, a very specific set of literature that's just for strings. So you might see a concert where only the string players are on the stage and then maybe later the rest of the orchestra comes out. So if that happens, that's called a string orchestra or sometimes a chamber orchestra, meaning small. Chamber in music means the same thing as room, so it comes from the tradition that this would be a group that would play in um, a room. Granted, it would be a very large room because we're talking about in somebody's palace probably, but as opposed to being in a concert hall, so a chamber group. All right, so we got our string players in there. All around behind them, we're going to have all the woodwinds and the brass. And the arrangement of that can vary, but it's fairly standard that right behind the strings, you will have the smallest instruments. So you have the flutes and the oboes. They are the highest pitched. They are harder to hear if you get them too far back in the orchestra. So we keep those up close right behind the uh, strings, usually two of each. And behind them, we would have a couple of clarinet players, a couple of bassoon players sort of like putting our tenors and bass parts in the choir, one right behind the other. So the high woodwinds, the low woodwinds, right behind each other. Again, in pairs, we will see a lot of pairs of instruments in the uh, woodwinds and brass. You might also have things like an English horn or a contrabassoon or other relatives of those instruments that we just talked about, and they would just be added on to that row. 
Then in the back, we have all the really loud instruments, and that would be the brass section. So you might see four to six French horn players, or maybe even just two, depending on the period of piece, across the back. And then trumpets, usually. Um, maybe three at the, at the most, unless it's some really massive, powerful kind of piece that needs lots of brass. Uh, then usually the trombones. And you will probably see two regular trombones, the kind that we looked at. And then you might also see a bass trombone, which is just a bigger version of it. It'll have a, a slightly larger bell, and you'd be able to tell that. And then if there's a tuba part, the tuba player would be back there with the trombone players. So now we've got strings, woodwinds, and a little clump in the middle, brass across the back. Usually the timpani are in a corner, now usually over on this side. So almost everything has a timpani part. But any other percussion that there happened to be in that piece will also be in the back. If it's a lot of percussion, lots of marimbas and xylophones and the, you know, a thousand crashing, banging things, they might even be all the way across the back or on both sides. So percussion could be anywhere. They, they take up a lot of space with their equipment, so we kind of have to put them where we can. But you'll see them all over the um, stage like that. Sometimes an orchestra uses piano as a part of the orchestra, not as a soloist. In most cases, the piano functions like a percussion instrument, so it's really playing um, chordy kinds of things. It's not being the big solo star that we might expect it to be. If there's a piano on the stage, it's usually right over here in this kind of gap where we didn't have a lot of percussion. You also, might also have a harp in the piece, and that would usually be over here with the string players as well. So a lot of people on the stage, that would be an orchestra. Now that we've talked about what makes up an orchestra and what you might expect to see, I'd like you to go watch a video of an orchestra. The piece I'd like you to listen to is Benjamin Britten's Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. Benjamin Britten is an English composer from the 20th century who wrote this piece so that people could really learn what all the different instruments sound like. He took a theme from another English composer from the 1600s and just ran it through the orchestra. Everybody gets to play it in various permutations and they kind of get to show off the specific skills of each instrument. So go to our YouTube listing and listen to that piece now. All right, now you've had a chance to listen to an orchestra. Let's look at another large kind of ensemble, and that is the wind ensemble, also sometimes called a concert band. So what we've now done is take the orchestra, which is an older ensemble, comes around in the 1700s. It's not until really the late 1800s and the early 20th century that we see the ensemble that we now know as a concert band. Partly that's because of some of the instruments that we use in the concert band hadn't even been invented yet or were fairly new at the time. But the really big impetus for for the band movement, particularly in America, was the Civil War. Because at the end of the Civil War, we had all these men who had been off and been part of their, their army bands. They came home, they wanted to keep doing that. So they would create town bands that would play in the square. You know, if you've been to many small towns, particularly in the Northeast, they've got a little gazebo somewhere in the middle of town and that's where the band would play. So that's the sort of the beginnings of the, the band movement. So originally they would have played things like marches, they would have played um, arrangements of orchestra music for the band. And as the 20th century goes along, we see there's a lot of literature written specifically for the band. So now it has its own repertoire, which is relatively new and much more modern sounding than what a lot, a lot of orchestras will play. So we don't have any string players in the concert band unless we happen to have a string bass player, which some composers will write for. I think they like the, the, the sound of a string bass in the back, usually um, playing plucked kinds of things. So all brass, woodwinds, percussion, except for maybe that lone string bass player and maybe the occasional harpist that they have for special effects. So we have a big number of people still. So but who's going to be the big number? Obviously, it's going to be the instruments that can't play as loudly. So we've got our flutes and clarinets and oboes in the front. Again, we like to keep them up front so they can be heard over all the loud brass players in the back. We're usually going to have more of those. So in a concert band, you might see as many as nine or ten clarinet players and maybe six or eight flute players. Why not so many flutes when they're smaller? They're higher pitched and a higher pitched sound is going to carry better than a medium pitched sound. Imagine um, the sound of somebody who screams, you know, a, a really high girly scream. You can hear miles away. But if you get a guy going, oh, 
it just doesn't carry as far. So the piccolo and the flute's gonna carry through and we don't have to have quite as many of those. So clarinets, flutes, piccolo, oboes, and sometimes the oboe players will also play English horn. One thing we have in the concert band that you don't see in the orchestra, except for very special kinds of pieces where they've added that, is saxophones. The saxophone's a pretty new invention. It really doesn't come around until the mid-1800s, so it kind of missed the boat on getting into the orchestra. And, I don't know, maybe it had an unsavory reputation at the time, so they just said, we're not letting them come. But the concert band does use saxophones, so you will usually see a couple of alto saxophones, a tenor, and a baritone. So you actually have the whole family, well, not the, all the family, because there's more bigger and smaller, but the generally the family of saxophones who will, who will be back there behind the other woodwinds. Then you'll usually have a couple of bassoons, and that pretty much takes care of our woodwind section. And then you'll have your brass instruments, so maybe four French horn players, sometimes five. Trumpets, we might see six or eight. And you might also notice, in, if it's a really professional kind of concert band, that we have both trumpets and cornets. We didn't look at both of those when we look at brass instruments, because the trumpet is the one that's used most often. But the cornet was, um, it's not really older or even newer, it's just different. The cornet is uh, sort of the chubby little brother of the trumpet. It plays in the same register, you play it the same way, but it's a little bit bigger around, so it has a more mellow sound. So if you see really long, shiny trumpets and sort of shorter looking trumpets, those are probably cornets, and some literature does ask for that. So you might see that in a concert band. And then you'll see some trombones, maybe six of those, and maybe two or three tubas. Another instrument you'll see in a concert band that you won't see in an orchestra is the euphonium. Euphonium is like a baby tuba, and as we watch this video, you, we will see one, and I'll point that out to you, so you'll be sure to know what that is. And then, of course, we have percussion, and wind ensembles generally use a lot more percussion than a, an orchestra would. We, you know, it's modern music, it's 20th century, and in the 20th century, percussion is really important, so we see a lot of that. So we're going to listen to a uh, part of a piece, at least, by the Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich, who is a modern composer. And this piece was actually written, I think, originally for orchestra. So this is a band playing a piece that was originally for orchestra, but it translates very nicely. So you get to hear every instrument of um, the wind ensemble in this particular recording. So listen to it over and over again, watch the players as they go, so you can start to associate those sounds with what you're seeing on the screen. All right, so those are the big ensembles. Let's talk now about smaller groups. You know, we've got all these different opportunities. It's kind of like going into the grocery store and trying to figure out which set of ingredients you want to use to make dinner tonight. You can mix them together in any way you want. There are some standards, obviously. The, the orchestra has become a standard recipe over time. The concert band is sort of standard. We have some other standard ensembles that we'll talk about, but keep in mind that when you go to a performance, you could see anything. There might be six flute players. There might be a trombone choir. They're not what we would call the standard traditional kinds of ensembles, but we use them all the time. So we're going to look at three smaller ensembles that are used quite a lot. The first is the string quartet. So gives us a lot of information. String players, quartet. So there must be four of them. First thing you might think, okay, four string players must be a violin, a viola, a cello, and a string bass, because those are our four instruments. But that is not the way it works out. Remember I said the string bass players don't get to do very much. They get to play in the orchestra. They get to play in jazz band. They don't get to play in these little ensembles as a general rule. The real on instrumentation for a string quartet is two violins, one viola, and a cello. So you have the two violins who, who sort of serve like the sopranos and altos would in a choir. And then you've got the viola who's sort of the tenor and the cello is playing the bottom. So you get the full range of notes covered and in, in a small little ensemble. The thing about a string quartet from a listener's standpoint is that it can be really difficult to tell who's playing what. It's a very homogeneous sound. All the strings have the same basic timbre. You hear a string instrument, you know it's a string instrument. But you may not know whether it's a cello or a viola, because if it's a cello playing up really high, or a viola playing down really low, they're in the same neighborhood of pitch. And so you, unless you're really attuned to the differences in their timbres, or you're watching them, you may not be able to tell. So don't beat yourself up if you can't. Sometimes I have a hard time with it as well. So 
Just say, okay, I know there's a string quartet and I'm going to listen for these things. You could probably pick out the cello pretty easily because it's going to be the bottom voice. First violin, you probably pick that out pretty well too. But the thing about a string quartet is that it's like a partnership. This is not a team with a quarterback and, well, let's take a smaller team because football has too many players, right? Let's uh, take basketball, which only has five players. You've got a couple of, of guards who run the ball down the court, and then you've got the two tall guys and the really tall guy who try to get it in the basket. So everybody has a role, but once it gets toward the basket, it, it kind of the roles change. In, a, in an ensemble setting like this, everybody is equally important. So there, it's, it's really a, a team effort, but everybody is an equal member of the team. There are no stars. So as you listen to this kind of music, you should really pay attention to how the the four parts blend together and transfer and move around because you'll see a lot of moving back and forth. As you watch performances like this, watch how the players communicate. We're now into small ensembles. There's no conductor. There's nobody waving a baton to keep them together. So how do they do it? They have to pay attention to each other. So you'll notice that they sit in a way that they can all see each other. And then if you watch, you'll see that they are communicating with each other either by looking, they're like a visual, like I'm staring at you, now it's your turn. Or you, if you watch closely, you'll see with these string players that they'll do little lifts. I'm going backwards with my violin. I better put my violin on the right shoulder. So I might lift with my violin, kind of lean into it. You'll see body cues that help the rest of them to know where we're going. Somebody obviously has to take the lead when there's a change of any sort. So you can watch and try to figure out who's doing that. So let's look now at a string quartet. And uh, it happens to be Shostakovich again. You know, so we'll get a little more Russian music like that. Right, so here we've seen a good example of what it really looks like at a concert. We have our four musicians, they come out, everybody applauds, they bow, even though they haven't done anything yet, except managed to get on the stage without falling down. We get, to, we get to applaud. They're going to sit down, and as we're going to see in a minute, they will have made a mistake before they start. So it sort of lets you know that musicians are humans. So the string quartet is... Um, um, not invented because you can't invent an ensemble, but it really kind of comes around in the mid-1700s. Joseph Haydn is the composer we consider to be the father of the string quartet. He was the one that said, you know, I really like this as an ensemble. I think I'll put this together and write some works for that. And he wrote lots of them and they're all wonderful. So you have plenty of opportunities to choose um, string quartets. So. All right, now let's look at the brass quintet, which is another small ensemble. It's got five players, as I said, it's a quintet. So we have two trumpet players, so sort of a first and second violin kind of approach to it. So we've got a high trumpet, and then the next trumpet is going to be maybe playing a little bit lower. And then we're going to have a French horn player, and a trombone player, and a tuba player. Now, poor euphonium players, they're sort of like uh, string bass players. They don't get to play in much of anything except concert band and maybe a tuba euphonium ensemble, which is another specialized kind of ensemble. So we have these five instruments. Normally, the two trumpet players will sit on the front and face each other, and then you'll have the uh, trombone and the uh, French horn on the sides and then the big tuba in the back sort of anchoring the whole ensemble. So we're going to listen to um, a rather interesting recording of a brass quintet. This is the Earl of Oxford's March, which is a very traditional kind of piece. But as you'll see from the video, the performers are anything but traditional. You'll see that these players weren't even sitting down. This was obviously a video they, they made kind of because it was fun. You know, standing on a dock in the middle of a lake. It's not the normal place you see a brass quintet. But I like you to know that musicians also kind of have a sense of humor about themselves occasionally, especially these small groups. It's easy to be portable. Uh, it's not so easy to be portable with a tuba, obviously, but all the other instruments are very easily toted about. So a lot of these groups uh, that are professionals will be um, sort of aware that modern audiences need to be entertained perhaps a bit more than an audience from the 1800s. And so they will do some things that you kind of go, whoa, look at that. Um, the Canadian brass in particular, they've played concerts wearing tutus when they're playing ballet music. So yeah, go figure. And this, this guy, I've got this French horn player with lots of hair. I'd really like to know if it's his own or if it's a wig. But anyway, you see a brass quintet here. 
They didn't set up the way I talked about because they're not sitting down. They were and recording out in the wild. They got to record so they can get the sound so the trumpets are facing you. All right, so that's a brass quintet. Let's look at the, the last of the small um, instrumental ensembles, and that is the woodwind quintet, or sometimes called the wind quintet. So we got woodwind quintet. Hmm, what, what, what might we have? We got flutes, we got clarinets, we got oboes, we got bassoons. That's only four. How are we going to fill that out? We could maybe add an extra one of those things, but we've already got flute and oboe, which are both high pitched instruments. Clarinet's fairly high pitched instrument. Bassoon's the only bottom instrument we've got in that set. So the instrument that we add to the woodwind quintet or the wind quintet is the French horn. We get to play a lot. We're in every kind of ensemble. So the French horn is added. It gives you a little extra bottom to the sound. It can play lower than the bassoon and it gives you some balance. Um, and this also blends very nicely with the woodwind. So that's why we get that combination. So much like the brass quintet, the highest instruments in the front, the lowest instruments at the bottom. So we're gonna watch this little video of a wind quintet playing themes from Harry Potter. So woodwind quintet or wind quintet, brass quintet, string quartet. You might also see something like a piano quintet. You think, wow, five piano players on a stage. How are they going to manage that? They're not for the most part. A piano quintet is actually a string quartet with a piano added to it. Then why they do that, I really can't explain to you. But you should just know that if you see an advertisement for a piano quintet, don't go thinking that you're going to get to see five pianos because that's probably not the case. String quartet plus a piano. All right, so we've been talking so far about mostly classically kind of oriented um, ensembles, but there's another important ensemble that you might encounter in your ventures out into the concert world, and that is the jazz ensemble. Obviously, that's a relatively new ensemble because jazz is relatively new compared to art music. But a jazz ensemble can be a lot of different kinds of things. In fact, if you went to YouTube and started just putting in jazz ensemble, you would find all kinds of groups. You might find a jazz ensemble that focuses on Latin kinds of music, so they would have a lot more Latin percussion. You might find an African kind of jazz ensemble, which would have more of African kinds of percussion and maybe some um, interesting woodwind instruments that we would not normally see. But the standard jazz ensemble comes from the 1940s period when we have the big swing bands of Benny Goodman and um, Duke Ellington. So basically, this jazz ensemble that in the traditional sort of sense is usually five trumpet players, five trombone players, a couple of tenor, a couple of alto saxes, a couple of tenor saxes, a baritone sax player, and then a rhythm section that would have a pianist, a drummer, a string a bass player, either an electric bass or a string bass, and probably a guitarist. So that would be your standard jazz band setup. They might add um, flutes or something. Most of the saxophone players might have a clarinet or a flute standing next to them that they switch back and forth. That's very common. So you might hear a lot of different kinds of sounds coming out, but really there's only about 19 or 20 people playing in a jazz ensemble. So let's look at a little bit of a jazz ensemble performance. You might have noticed that there is a conductor for the jazz ensemble, but they don't generally really conduct. In a jazz ensemble, the conductor usually just starts them off. We call that kicking off the band. So they'll go one, two, one, two, three, and the band will off, they'll go. And unless there's some sort of transition or something like a big tempo change, the conductor really just sort of stays out of the way. So their real job is to get them ready for the performance. And after that, they just get them going and step out and let the band do their own thing. So those are most of the instrumental ensembles that you might encounter in your regular forays out into the concert world. Let's take a look at a couple of vocal ensembles because you will encounter those as well. As the biggest of a uh, the biggest vocal ensemble would be, in the most traditional sense, called a chorus. Again, that's a word that gets used a lot of different ways. We talked about a chorus as being part of opera, oratorio, and cantata as a as a work for a chorus. But in the sense of an ensemble, a chorus is usually a huge kind of choir, what we would call a choir. So a great big choir is generally called a chorus. So let's watch a little bit of the Chicago Symphony Chorus, which is performing with the Chicago Symphony, as they usually do. So you can see by looking at this choir, this is huge. This must be like 100 people in the choir. 
but um, a chorus is going to usually perform things that are performed with an orchestra. And it's a matter of numbers. If you're going to do a piece with orchestra and singers, you have to have a lot of singers to be balancing out the orchestra. As a general rule, they don't use microphones. You, you might in a really big concert hall have, have the chorus mic'd so that they can be heard over the orchestra, but the tradition was not. When, when these pieces were first written, there were no microphones, so the choir had to be big to be able to be heard over the orchestra. You will see different arrangements in a chorus, um, but generally the men are together, so the basses sing together and the tenors and then the, the altos and the sopranos are in their own parts. So you're singing next to people who sing the same thing that you might be singing. That's not necessarily the case in our next kind of uh, vocal ensemble, which is called the chamber choir. Remember, chamber means smaller, like in a room. So a chamber choir usually only has maybe 20, maybe 40 people in it. It's going to be fairly small. And so that means, you know, if we've got, even if there are 40 people and you've got first soprano, second sopranos, altos, first tenor, second tenors, baritones, basses, that's six different vocal parts, and that's not an uncommon number. We've got 40 people, that means maybe six or seven people singing each part. So everybody in a chamber ensemble has to be good because you can't hide. If you're in a choir, a chorus with 100 people, you, know, you can get covered up. If you don't know something, you just move your mouth and it'll all come out anyway. Chamber group, you have to know your stuff because you're generally going to be it for your group. So let's listen to a little bit of a piece from the 1600s for chamber choir. You'll notice that there are far fewer people and they are sort of spread around on the stage a little more as well. You'll notice that they had a conductor. Um, even though there's a, it's a fairly small number of performers, choral groups usually do work with a conductor, unless it's a jazz kind of group where they're doing a lot of choreography and things where they're too busy to be watching the conductor anyway. So we've seen in this segment lots of different kinds of ensembles, from the really big, like the orchestra and the chorus, down to very small, like a woodwind quintet. And I hope you'll be going to lots of concerts and checking out lots of different kinds of ensembles so you can find out which are the ones that you like the best.